Just a few days ago, one of the pro members dropped a really sleek website in our private server as inspiration. There is no doubt everything about the site felt deliberate and well executed, but for me, it was the specific scroll animation in the middle that really stole the show. As soon as you reach there, a single image scales in from the center while the title above slowly slides upward into view. Then, as you continue scrolling, that image splits cleanly into three panels, and before you know it, each of those panels flips 180 degrees to reveal content on the back. I was genuinely impressed with how fluid and interesting the whole sequence felt, and there was no way I was and going to try rebuilding it myself. So after a few hours experimenting, I put together a similar version of that scroll animation powered entirely by GSAP and scroll trigger. In this video, I'll walk you through how it works and how you can build scroll driven animation sequences like this using just the on update callback and some simple GSAP twins. We'll be animating basic CSS properties like border radius, flexbox gap, transform values, all based on scroll progress. If you find these kinds of rebuilds helpful, make sure you leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you'd like to access the source code for this project, plus hundreds of other similar micro projects and a brand new website template every month, you can check out the pro membership via the link in the description. Alright, let's get in. Before we jump into the code, let me quickly talk about the assets. As you saw in the demo, there is a moment where a single image appears in the center of the page and then splits into three separate cards as you scroll. Now technically, there are a few different ways you could approach this. One option is to use the same full image on each card and just shift the background position so it lines up, creating the illusion of one complete image. But in practice, I found that method a little over-engineered for what we need. The simpler approach, and the one I'm using here, is to manually split the base image into three equal parts using a tool like Photoshop or Figma. This way, you end up with three cropped images, one for each card, and when placed side by side, they visually form the original image. Just make sure that, before you slice the image, you are working with the correct aspect ratio. In this project, each card has a 5 to 7 aspect ratio, so when the three cards aligned, the full image should be sized at 15 by 7. So, to set this up, you can create a canvas in your design tool that's say 1500 by 700 pixels or anything larger as long as it matches that aspect ratio. Drop your image in, split it evenly into thirds and export each piece separately. Once you have saved those, just place the images inside your project folder and we are ready to move on. Alright, let's jump into the HTML. We'll structure the page using three main sections, an intro, a sticky section and an outro. To give the layout some context and keep the scroll sequence from feeling isolated, I'll start by adding a full height intro section with a simple h1. Same for the outro, just another h1 at the end so the scroll experience feels bookended. Now let's get to the main section, the sticky part where the animation happens. First, I'll add a heading inside a div with the class sticky header. This element will be pushed down and hidden by default. We'll reveal it later with the scroll animation. It will slide into place just above the cards. Next, I'll add a div with the class card container. This will hold Hold all three of our animated cards. Let's start by setting up the first one. I'll create a div with the class card and also give it a unique ID like card1. We'll use that ID later for styling things like border radius, background color and also to target it during animation. Inside the card, we'll need two sides, a front and a back. I'll place an image inside the card front div. This will be one of the image slices we prepared earlier in the asset section. Then, inside the card back div, I'll add a span for the index and a paragraph with the label or name of this card. Once that's done, I'll just duplicate this structure two more times, changing the IDs, images, and content for each card. And that's it, the full HTML structure is now ready. Next, we'll move on to the CSS and start styling everything. First, I'll bring in a serif font from Google Fonts that will give the layout a more refined editorial feel. I'll use it as the primary typeface across the entire page. Next, I'll define a few global color variables, one for the background, one for the foreground, and three unique colors for each of the cards. We'll use these consistently across the layout and animations. Then, I'll reset the default spacing, I'll remove margins and paddings from everything, and set up the box model so we get clean, predictable sizing across the board. Now I'll apply the new font to the body. This locks in our overall typeface for the page. For the images, I'll make sure they always fill their container and scale properly without any distortion. Next, I'll style the headings and paragraphs. The headings will be large, bold, and tightly spaced, perfect for that clean, modern look. Paragraphs will follow the same line height and wait for consistency. Each section, intro, sticky, and outro will take up the full screen height. 
They'll all have background and text colors pulled from our variables along with some inner padding for breathing room. For the intro and outro sections, I center the content both vertically and horizontally and limit the heading width so the text looks balanced on large screens. Now we'll style this sticky section. This is where all the animation happens. I'll use Flexbox to center everything in this sticky section both horizontally and vertically. Next, I'll style the sticky heading slightly above the center and push it down so it starts off the card container. We'll bring it into place later with animation. I'll also set up the heading so its opacity and opposition can be animated smoothly. We'll use fill change to hint those properties to the browser for better performance. Now let's work on the card container. I'll size it to take up most of the width and give it perspective so the 3D card flip effect works correctly. I'll also shift the entire container downward slightly so it aligns properly with the heading. Again, I'll hint the width property with will change for smoother transitions. Each card inside the container will share the same structure. I'll size them using a tall vertical ratio, enable 3D transforms and set the origin at the top for a clean flip motion. For the leftmost and rightmost cards, I'll apply different border radius to round just the outer corners. Now inside each card, we have two sides, a front and a back. Both will be stacked on top of each other using absolute positioning. They'll share the same size and inherit the border radius from the parent card. To set up the flip effect, I'll hide the back side using a 3D technique. The back will be rotated and hidden from view by default. On the back side, I'll center the content using Flexbox and add some padding. I'll also position the index number near the top left corner with reduced opacity for a subtle touch. Each card gets its own background color on the back using the color variables we defined earlier. For the first card, I'll also switch the text color to dark so it contrasts better with the light background. Now let's add some responsiveness. When the screen width drops below a certain size, I'll reduce the heading font size. I'll also let the intro and outro text span the full width so it doesn't feel too narrow on mobile. In this sticky section, I'll switch from row layout to a vertical stack. I'll add padding, change the card layout to column and apply spacing between each card. The sticky heading will no longer be absolutely positioned. Instead, I'll let it flow naturally above the cards. At this size, we won't animate anything, so I'll make sure all transforms like rotation, translation, and perspective are reset and removed. That way, the layout remains clean and accessible. And finally, I'll give each card a consistent border radius so everything looks tidy on small screens. Alright, with this styling in place, we are now ready to jump into the JavaScript and start wiring up the scroll animation. Before we start writing the animations, let's first set up the basic environment and plan how everything is going to work. In this project, we'll be using GSAP as our main animation library. We'll combine it with Scroll Trigger, which is GSAP's built-in plugin that lets us control animations directly through scroll progress. And then we'll also use Lenis, which handles smooth scrolling, giving the entire page that subtle fluid motion as we scroll through the sections. So I'll first import all of these, GSAP, Scroll Trigger and Lenis, right at the top of the file. That's going to form the base of our setup. Now the entire script will run once the document is fully loaded. So I'll wrap everything inside a DOM content loaded event listener. This just ensures that all the HTML elements are ready before we start targeting them with animations. Inside this function, the first thing we'll do is register scroll trigger with GSAP. That step is necessary anytime you're using a GSAP plugin. Otherwise, GSAP won't recognize it. Next, we'll create a new instance of Lenis this will replace the browser's default scrolling behavior with a smoother, frame-driven one, something that feels much more polished and consistent. So we'll need to connect them manually. To do that, I'll paste a block of code from Lenny's documentation. This setup gives us complete control over both systems. Scroll trigger handles the animation logic, and Lenny's keeps the motion itself consistent across all devices. Once that's done, we'll grab a few DOM elements that we'll be animating later. We'll select the card container since that's the main element we'll be resizing and spacing out and also the sticky header which will fade and slide into place as we scroll through the sticky section. Now before we start defining the animations themselves, I'll set up a couple of flags. One is called is gap animation completed and another called is flip animation completed. These will act as control checks, basically little switches to make sure certain animations only play once when we hit the right scroll position and not continuously on every scroll update. This keeps the motion clean and prevents flickering or looping effects when we scroll back and forth. Next, I'll define a function called init functions. This will become our main setup function, the one that initializes all scroll triggers and controls how the animation behaves at different viewport sizes. 
For now, I'll keep it empty. We'll fill it out in the next step. Right after defining it, I'll call it right away so everything runs as soon as the page loads. And finally, I'll add a resize listener. This is important because scroll trigger and lenis both rely on screen dimensions to calculate distances and scroll ranges. So whenever the user resizes the window, we'll wait for a short moment and then reinitialize everything. That way, all of our scroll calculations stay accurate and responsive no matter what device or window size we are on. So at this point, we have set up the base environment. We have connected Lenis for smooth scrolling, registered scroll trigger for scroll control, and built the foundation for our animation logic. Next, we'll move into the init animations function, where we'll actually configure scroll trigger and start defining how the cards behave as we scroll. All right, now let's start building the main animation logic inside the function. The very first thing I'll do here is clear out any existing scroll triggers. We are doing this because init animations function can get rerun, especially when the user resizes the window so we want to make sure we are always starting fresh next i'll set up a match media instance using gsap this will let us apply different logic based on the screen width so we can completely disable the scroll animation on smaller screens and only activate it when there is enough space to display the full layout i'll start with the mobile case anything below certain width if the screen is small i'll skip all animations entirely Instead, I'll just reset the inline styles on the cards, the card container, and the sticky header so everything stacks naturally and behaves like a regular vertical layout. This fallback is important because there is no point running complex scroll logic on smaller screens where the layout switches to a column. Next, we'll define the logic for desktop screens. This is where all the scroll triggered animation comes in. Inside this breakpoint, I'll create a new scroll trigger instance tied to the sticky section. We'll pin the entire sticky section in place, which means as the user scrolls, this section stays fixed on screen for a few scroll lengths, giving us room to play animations frame by frame. I'll define a custom scroll range, basically starting when the sticky section hits the top of the screen and ending after a few viewport heights worth of scroll distance. I'll also enable scrub so that the animation is fully synced with scroll progress. As the user scrolls down, the animation timeline progresses. If they scroll back up, it reverses, just like scrubbing through a video frame by frame. This gives the experience a really smooth and controlled feel. Now inside the on update callback, we'll get access to a progress value. This is a number between 0 and 1 that tells us how far the user has scrolled through the pin section. With that progress, we'll start controlling different elements in real time based on specific scroll ranges. Let's start with the sticky heading. Between about 10% and 25% scroll progress, we want to animate the heading into view. To do that, I'll use map range to convert that scroll segment into a normalized value from 0 to 1. This gives us finer control over the animation easing. We can control exactly how far it's moved and how much it has faded in. Even within that small scroll window, I'll map the scroll progress to a Y value for the vertical position and also to an opacity value so the heading slides upward and fades in at the same time. Then I'll use GSAP's set method to apply those styles on every scroll update, adjusting its vertical position and opacity as the user scrolls forward. If the scroll is below 10%, I'll reset the heading back to its starting position and set opacity to 0 so it remains hidden before the animation begins. And if the user scrolls past 25%, I'll make sure the heading is fully visible and locked in place so we don't accidentally apply unnecessary transforms after it's done animating in. This gives us a nice smooth entrance for the title, perfectly timed with scroll. Now let's continue building the rest of the animation sequences. First, we'll focus on the width of the card container. Between 0% and 25% scroll progress, I want the card container to expand outwards. This gives us a smooth visual transition where we go from a compact and structured layout to a wide container. To make this happen, I'll use map range again. We'll map the scroll progress from 0 to 0.25 to a width range that starts narrow and ends wider. This way, as we scroll, the container slowly expands and each card gets pulled toward the center. I'll calculate the new width using that mapped value and apply it with GSAP set method. This ensures it updates on every frame, keeping it perfectly synced with the scroll position. And once we scroll past 25%, I'll just lock the container at its final width so it stays consistent for the next part of the animation. Next, I want to introduce a visual change that makes the cards feel more distinct and independent like they are separating from a unified block into individual elements. So at around 35% scroll progress, I'll run two things but only once. First, I'll animate the gap property of the card container. This increases the spacing between all three cards, pushing them apart horizontally. This helps break the tight, single block feel from earlier and starts to give them more presence. 
Second, I line and made the border radius on all three cards. We'll round off all the corners uniformly, giving the cards a softer, more card-like look, almost like they are preparing to flip. Both of these animations run with a small duration and smooth easing to keep the motion elegant. And once those animations complete, I'll flip the is gap animation completed flag to true. This tells us not to repeat this block again while scrolling forward. It should only trigger once unless we reverse the direction. Now, if the user scrolls back about 35%, I want everything to reverse cleanly. So I'll reset the gap back to zero, pulling all the cards back together. And instead of setting the same border radius for all cards, I'll restore their original values. The first card gets rounded only on top left and bottom left corners. The last card gets rounded on the top right and bottom right and the middle card stays with square corners. That gives us back the original appearance from the very beginning of the scroll section where the cards look like a single connected unit. Once that's done, I'll reset this gap animation completed flag to false so it can run again when needed. Now we'll move into the final stage. This is the big moment where the cards actually flip over to reveal the back side. This gets triggered when we hit 70% scroll progress and again we only want this to happen once. So first. I'll rotate all three cards along the y-axis, we'll spin them exactly halfway so they show the back face. We'll also add a slight stagger. This means the cards flip one after another with a tiny delay in between. While the cards are flipping, I'll also apply some motion tweaks to the first and third cards, the ones on the left and right. I'll shift them slightly downward and apply a bit of z-axis tilt, one to the left and one to the right. This creates a nice subtle swing. Almost like the cards are leaning outward as they rotate. It adds just enough 3D variation to keep things visually interesting and cinematic just as we saw on the original site. Once this block completes, I'll set this flip animation completed flag to true so we don't keep repeating it. Now just like before, if the user scrolls back above 70%, I want to reverse everything. So I'll rotate all the cards back to their original position facing front. I'll use the same duration and easing, but this time the stagger in reverse so the last card flips first and the first card flips last. And for the outer cards, I'll reset their Y position and Z rotation back to zero, flattening them out again so they look perfectly aligned. This completely undoes the flip and brings everything back to the pre-flip state. And of course, I'll reset this flip animation completed flag to vaults, allowing the flip to play again if the user scrolls forward a second time. So with just these three blocks, width scaling, gap, plus radius reveal, and the final card flip, we have now built a complete scroll driven animation timeline that responds to the user's movement frame by frame. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.